All right, Alexander, let's, uh, let's talk about Teflon Premier, Teflon Rute. And I, that's what he's being dubbed, actually, in the Netherlands, from what I'm reading from various articles. But I think we're the ones that came up with that name. Is there, didn't we invent that name, Teflon, I, Teflon I think Rute? We did. I think we did. Yeah, I think we did. <laughs> I, know, I know we've come up with Teflon Trudeau. But uh, anyway, uh, Rute, okay, so he won the election uh, after a scandal broke out. They had uh, they had elections in March. He won those elections, and um, now he's embroiled in another scandal. And uh, this scandal has to do with uh, with him lying to to the people of uh, the Netherlands, lying to uh, to his peers, to Parliament, and uh, he just barely survived. Barely survived a no confidence vote, but he survived yet again. I mean, this is, it's incredible. It, he won re-election off of a scandal and immediately, literally a week or two afterwards, he's in another scandal, but he, he, he still continues to survive. So um, take us into this latest uh, scandal. It involves um, a lawmaker by the name of Peter o- Omzigt. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. O-M-T-Z-I-G-T. You are involves indeed. a lawmaker. Yeah, you are indeed. a lawmaker there. And there was uh, lies that Rutte was uh, was telling about whether he was going to give him a job. And uh, the press caught some uh, some stuff that jotted down on a piece of paper. And it showed that he was lying. So we have proof that he was lying. But he, he survived. So, Alexander, take us into the story. It's a fascinating story. In fact, the two um, scandals, the one that led to the fall of the previous Rutte government in the election which Rutte won and this new scandal are closely interconnected to each other. Now, the, the MP in question is Peter Omtzigt, who uh, was a Christian Democrat MP who exposed the child benefit scandal which had led, which led to the fall of Rutte's previous government. Now, over the course of um, the original scandal, Rutte made several claims, and one of them was that he hadn't actually d- discussed Omtzigt with any other uh, party and with any other uh, political figure, and that he hadn't been involved in the affair at all because he was, um, you know, not not directly implicated in the struggle in 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 the in the in that scandal in any way whatsoever. Well. What then happened just a few days ago is that his Home Affairs uh, Minister, who's somebody called Kaiser Erlingen, uh, tested positive and um, had to uh, leave for a time the parliamentary complex which houses the Dutch Parliament. And she was seen with a number of briefing notes, one of which uh, showed and was photographed showing that there had in fact been an discussion about Omtzigt by, uh, between R- Rutte and um, a politician called Sigrid Kag of the Lib- Liberal D66 party, which is the party with which Rutte was going to form a coalition. So Rutte lied about uh, Omtzigt. He said that he had, in fact, discussed Omtzigt. He did, in fact, discuss Omtzigt, and he discussed object with Sigrid Karg, who is um, his most likely coalition partner. Now, this provoked uproar. There was a censor vote, which was, by the way, proposed by none other than Geert Fielders. Um, as you correctly say, uh, he, uh, um, um, Ruta survived the no confidence vote, but he has been censured by the Dutch Parliament. So the Dutch Parliament appears to accept that he lied, even though he denies that he lied. He says he can't remember. Where did you hear that one before? And um, the result is that he is still prime minister. He survived a no confidence vote, but he's been censured by the Dutch Parliament. Perhaps of greater concern to him is that Karg, who was going to be his primary coalition partner, has now said that she will not, in fact, form a coalition with him. She said that our parts, pa- our paths part here and the distance between him and me is wider. I regret that. So 
And my trust in Mr. Ruta has been seriously dented today. So it looks as if, at the moment, Ruta's plans to form a coalition are up in the air, and he's been again damaged by this scandal. Will it bring him down? I have to say I don't think so. I think that sooner or later something will be patched together because um, Ruta, who is the practitioner of Merkelism in Germany, that is to say, uh, in, in, in the Netherlands, that is to say, government from the centre, where you tilt a bit to the left and you tilt a bit to the right, depending on the eddies and currents of the uh, political, uh, political feeling in your country. He remains the pivotal figure in Dutch politics as a result of his skill in playing this game. The Dutch have seen uh, you know, a, a, a bit under the curtain, if you like. You've seen the seamy and sordid side of this type of politics. It's very like the kind of thing that Merkel does in Germany. Ruta does it in the Netherlands. But I don't think in the end this is going to be a big enough crisis to bring him down. And sooner or later, I think some kind of coalition will be formed. But it gives you an insight into the state of politics in the Netherlands in the sense that people see a politician Rutte, who lies to Parliament, lies to the people, lies to the during an election. He forms all kinds of uh, coalitions. He conducts politics in a completely sordid way. But he is, in effect, immovable and irreplaceable. And this cynical way of conducting politics is inevitably going to make the Dutch people increasingly cynical about their politics. Sooner or later, this will all fail, as it is currently starting to do, or at least not starting, as it is clearly doing in Germany itself. But I think the Netherlands is still some way behind Germany, and Rutte is still, as I said, in control in the Netherlands and likely to remain so. All right, so real quick, uh... Rutte wanted to to remove Obzicht from Parliament because he yes. was critical of him. Yes, and and he was yes. the person. Essentially, he was one of the leading forces in the previous scandal that led to the elections. So this was kind of a move by Rutte, That's and I guess you could say D66 yeah. D66 leader Cog as well, since they were in discussion. So it's interesting that she's trying to distance herself from this scandal. Very yeah. very shrewd move. I mean, because when you don't want to form a coalition government, that means you don't want ministers in the cabinet. That means you don't want to have power. So that's how much this scandal has affected D66 and uh, COG as well. I mean, when you form a coalition, that means you're going to get power. And that's what every politician and every political party wants. So just in essence, I mean, th this was a very uh, cynical, very shrewd move by Rutte and I would guess D66 to try and get an opponent out of the way by giving them... A position. Am I characterizing this correct? You got it exactly right. That's exactly what it is. It's an entirely cynical piece of political, uh, um, you know, uh, jobbery behind the scenes. Get rid of a get rid buy off get rid of a, a, a an MP who's causing you trouble. Form a coalition. Divide the spoils between you. And of course, Karg is now saying that she doesn't want to go into coalition with Ruta. But I don't think anybody really takes that seriously. I'm sure eventually, sooner or later, a coalition will be formed and she will find that, you know, all her trust in Ruta, which has been lost, has been suddenly rediscovered and we will see politics conducted as normal. Bear in mind that the whole purpose of D66, which is an ultra pro-Europe party, is to keep this whole system uh, this Merkelist system that we have in the in the in the Netherlands to keep it late, to keep it going, and that's what the whole reason for the surge in D sixty six was all about. It's presented as this you know exciting new party full of all sorts of you know wonderful ideas and you know attractive personalities that, but ultimately. It's a repackaged 
mechanism for preserving the status quo. And um, if that reminds you a little bit of Macron, for example, in France, who came out of nowhere and uh, was again packaged as young, attractive, dynamic. He's going to shake things up. And it's turned out to be a total status quo establishment politician. Well, that's what D66 is. It's the same uh, uh, mechanism that's been used in the used in the Netherlands that's now been used in all sorts of other places. Also, I mean, Podemos in Spain was a bit like that. The five star movement in Italy, it turns out, was a bit like that, too. And D66 is just the latest incarnation of that, if you like, in the Netherlands. So, yes, in the short term, Karg is saying that she doesn't want to enter into a coalition with Rutte and that she's completely lost all trust with him. But I expect that sooner or later she'll be back. And uh, uh, Rutte or Root, I'm sorry, I can never get his remember how to pronounce his name, but I'm sure he'll be back. He'll be ruling the roost in the Netherlands and things will remain there as always. What does this, uh, what does this tell you about the, uh, the Netherlands and these Eurocentric parties? Because once again, we have Rutte, who's Eurocentric. We have Kog, who's ultra Eurocentric, a natural fit for them to form a coalition. But, you know, scandal after scandal after scandal, but they keep on winning and winning and winning. What do you, what do you think this, this says about where the Netherlands is heading? Well, it, it's the same right across Europe, not just in the Netherlands, which is that whatever one may think about the European Union and the way it functions, the one thing these people are extremely good at is at holding on to power. They, are, they have, it ought to be said and admitted, a critical mass of support still in the populations of various countries. And what they do is that they hold on to power through essentially governing from the centre. And whenever one party falls into problems, another party is created to take its place. And you see a constant juggling of the pieces. It, but ultimately, the same, the, you know, the thing, the thing remains the same. It's like the Greens, if I may say so, in Germany, which uh, the Greens started out way back in the 1980s and even before then, the 1970s, as a genuine and anti-establishment party. They are now complete establishment, but they still pretend they're anti-establishment and they're looking to form the new government in Germany in September. But it will be the same policies of the same Europeanism all over again. And I think this can work for a time. It can work for a very long time. But sooner or later, because problems are not being addressed and democratic options are being excluded, because Remember, when people vote for uh, different parties, they expect those parties to be different. They don't want parties to be the same. And when you have politics like this, when all parties are the same, sooner or later, you will see the political uh, uh, faith in politics uh, collapse, cynicism grow. And then at that point, a real political challenge from the outside will emerge. Now, there's a very this form of politics was invented in Italy in the 19th century, where it was called transformismo, politics from the center. It, it was it, its essence was famously captured by a um, um, an Italian writer of that period, who was, by the way, also a prince, uh, the Prince of Lamp the Prince of Lampedusa. And he said, the more things change, everything must change so that it can remain the same. What happened in Italy, though, was that they continued with this for so long that in the end, the Republic, the, the Italian Republic broke down. And of course, in Italy's case, you got the rise of Mussolini. Well, I don't think it's going to happen like that in Europe this time. But eventually, 
the system simply disintegrates. It breaks down because people become utterly cynical and disengaged from politics. They no longer believe that democracy is working for them. They no longer think that it is any democracy in any meaningful sense. And they start looking for radical alternatives outside the system. And eventually, sooner or later, some person emerges who is completely uncompromising, but who has the charisma and the political ability and the political skill to survive the kind of attacks that, let's say, Kurt Wilders has faced in the Netherlands and put the thing uh, and actually mount a real challenge. In the Netherlands, we're far from that point. It's a very prosperous, rich, stable European country. It, other places, Italy, Spain, Germany, are much closer to that point of breakdown. But sooner or later, it will come, and it will come everywhere. And what the shape of politics will then be, I don't know. But there comes a point where, as I said, when people see corrupt politicians, which is how Karg and Ruth must appear to most people in the Netherlands now, carry, you know, carrying out deals, stitching things together, engaging in backstairs intrigues that they lie about, um, but still carrying on exactly as before and remaining in power. There comes a point when people say, enough, we can't accept this anymore, especially if the economy starts to go bad and things start to go wrong and people, uh, people's faith in the system evaporates. So it's a Europeanism and a centrism that is incubating a massive crisis. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, you look at, you know, Germany and Merkel's been there forever, it seems. You look at France and, yeah. you know, what was Macron? Just a repackaging of Hollande. So essentially it's the same dude the <laughs> same guy that's been there forever. They just, like you said, they just cleverly repackaged Olad. Uh, you look at the Netherlands now, and and they've they've done a real tricky marketing thing where they've kind of, you know, uh, cut out a chunk of uh, of the one year pro Euro party to create another pro Euro party, repackage it, and then try to form a coalition. And what do you know? Both of them are caught, uh, you know, BSing and lying about stuff. I mean, yeah. not even five minutes into government and they've Absolutely. already been caught lying and uh, and gaming the system. I just wonder how long, you know, how long people are going to uh, continue to to put up with this stuff. It's, it's really incredible because these people have been power. Well, they've been in power. Urute has been in power forever, it seems. Merkel forever. How long yeah. are they going to continue to put up Absolutely. with it? It's, it's a big question that I have. I well, it's a, it's a big question we all have. But what I will say again is the longer they, they stay in power, the more damage they do, the more damage they do, the more certain it becomes that the collapse when it happens, and it will happen, and it will come suddenly when it happens, the more devastating and traumatic it will be. But we are still very much in that politics, in that style of politics at the moment. Unfortunately, there is no clear-cut alternative to it anywhere in Europe. Um, options are, are very strong, are, you know, are clearly ruled out. But sooner or later, this thing will fail. It always does. I mean, you can't... I mean, you summed up what has happened perfectly. But you can't carry on politics indefinitely in this way, changing everything all the time so that it remains the same. You know, reinventing Hollande as Macron and pretending that there's some change and some difference when everybody knows deep down that that's absolutely not the case and that Macron, far from being the political outsider, and challenger that everybody is that he's being packaged as is really the ultimate insider who's there to correct protect the establishment of which he is an absolute and essential part so i mean you can't go on doing this forever but they've been doing it for a very long time and i think 
they'll go on doing it for a while yet. Of course, it's important to talk about corruption. And you mentioned at the beginning of the piece about how, you know, going into coalition means ministerial jobs and, you know, big cars and big salaries and secretaries and PAs and all that sort of thing. I mean, that is a form of corruption, giving people all of that for in return for places in the system. Um, and of course, they always justify it. They say, oh, well, you know, we, we go into government because at least that way we can achieve something, even if, you know, we, you know, we, we, we may not be able to achieve everything we want, but, you know, we can make at least some progress on some of our ideas. I mean, that's, that's what Podemos, for example, which started as an anti-capitalist party, if you can believe it. That's what they're saying in Spain, even as they are a junior party in Sanchez's uh, uh, pro-EU government in Madrid. Well, they always say that, but ultimately, it's, there's the, the lure of benefits of, you know, the big cars, the chauffeurs, the uh, swanky offices, the PAs, all that is enormously attractive. And of course, the big salaries too. And of course, all the jobs you can provide to your friends. So corruption, because that's what it is, oils the wheels and it keeps the whole show going. But of course, that simply intensifies the cynicism that most people have. Yeah. Well, that's what they're in it for, the power and the money. That's Absolutely. all across the board, Absolutely. whether you're in the Quite. US or in Europe, that's uh, the power of the uh, money. Absolutely. I mean, I, 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 I know for myself, I mean, uh, I, you know, both of us um, come close to have been, well, I, I've been extremely close to the political world in Greece and I've seen its attractions and I've seen the way some people were drawn to it. I wasn't myself, but I've seen how many and how strongly most people who are exposed to it, how how drawn to it they are. And how, as I said, they suddenly discover that, you know, there are all sorts of practical advantages to being in power, which they had uh, um, previously, you know, they had denied previously. And we've just seen a, a case study of this in the Netherlands. Yes, we have. All right, we'll leave it there. Alexander Berkers, thank you very much. Guys, I'll drop a code for the Durant shop down below. 10% off. Use that code. 10% off all the merch. Take care, everybody.